Thanks to Paul Espinosa for hanging out with us for uh, the last hour there. It's unusual to not be calling him Delegate Paul Espinosa any longer, but uh, things change. you got to adapt. Delegate's not like a coach. Like, you know, once, once when you're a coach, once you're a coach, you're always a coach. Everyone will always look at you. Your players will always come back and see Rob, and they'll, hey, coach, how's it going? So delegate doesn't work that way? It, it's not – senator yeah, doesn't not, work that way? It's a current yeah. title, right? It's current. Not, a, not okay. a title for life. Senator works that way, doesn't it? Yes. Okay, and now honorable, right? He's honorable forever? That I don't know. Uh, okay. <laughs> Depends on the conviction. <laughs> Possibly. <laughs> Possibly. Our guest in this segment is the Senate President, Craig Blair. Craig, pull your mic a little closer to you and aim it more toward. There you go. Awesome. Uh, good morning. Thanks good, for coming in. Good morning. Thank you for having me on the show. Good time. Pressure's off this election day, huh? Oh, it's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't deny it. Um, the biggest problem I have today is trying to figure out where my polling precinct is because things got shifted around now, and I've early voted before when I was working in Charleston. Right. And uh, so then I didn't do it here, and I've got to figure out where I'm supposed to go. It used to be James Rumsey, and the website is actually showing that I live on Ridge Road North. And that's not accurate either, so I've got a little bit of work to do today. I think you have Tony's number. Just give him a call. Yeah. <laughs> Tony, what do I vote? I, I, I would prefer figuring out how the average citizen works with it. Uh, so Why? You can't do anything to fix it anymore. So <laughs> <laughs> Just call and be a pain, like everybody else. <laughs> that, is, that is how the average citizen works. That's it. <laughs> call and be a pain, yeah. That's what I would do. Well, th th I might still be able to help fix things into the future. So, <laughs> uh, let's uh, let's talk before we get into election stuff. October revenue numbers uh, down fifteen million. Did I read that correctly? Uh, yeah, we were down for the general revenue collections about fifteen million dollars. Uh, for the year, though, it's about thirteen point eight million dollars under revenue estimates. That's not too bad. Uh, it's it's not where we want to be. Uh, this time last year, uh, we would have been two hundred forty two million dollars over revenue estimates. Now, so now, why the change? And I can t give you to a greater degree where the change is at, and that is, is less money is being taken off people's paychecks in the form of tax collections on the personal income tax. Personal income tax collections for the month, though, was down $16 million from revenue estimates, and that's $33 million at this point in time in the year. And we're about one-third of the way through the fiscal year. Severance taxes are still off. We're $15 million down for the month and almost $20 million down for the year. Now, here's the one that gives me pause. Uh, sales tax collections was off of $2.1 million. It's not a lot, but it's going in the wrong direction on that. But for the the year, it's only $397,000. So that one's sort of still balanced. But I'm afraid that the consumer confidence is starting to drop a little bit. And that means that uh, resources of whether it's of liquid assets uh, to be able to go and purchase something or do things uh, is diminishing for them. Now, here's the good news on this report. And that is the corporate net. The corporate net uh, is a tax on businesses' profitability. Of, and businesses are very much so profitable again in the state of West Virginia. We're basically exactly where we were last year. Uh, it's $15 million above the revenue estimates for the year, or excuse me, for the month. Uh, but for the year, we're only $10 million above the revenue estimates. For the year. Uh, yeah, and I'm, I'm, to be quite honest with you, I think that number's wrong. It's something I may have missed of when we proof these mm -hmm. i got to go back and take a look at that i might do that during the break you think uh, the number's higher or lower i think the number's higher okay. uh, if, if that was not the case i know the corporate net's been up almost every month above so it can't be down below that it's probably a hundred million dollars uh over for, for the year okay so, to, uh, so maybe a typo emitted a zero yes uh, and that happens, and we we have a process in the Senate because almost everybody uses our numbers on this, where the, uh, Eric Tarr, the finance chairman, and I 
review these after they're completed before we ever submit them out. And we go through and look at the numbers and look at to the managing and see what's going on. As I'm sitting here reading, it's like, oh, this one's standing out. I don't think that that's right. Mm-hmm. Uh, Rainy Day Fund, uh, that's another shining star for us right now. Is $1.3 billion in the Rainy Day Fund. Of, and a year ago, at this point in time, it was right around one point one eight. Uh, so you're seeing of a hundred and twenty million dollar increase on the rainy day fund. That's good news. Unemployment. Uh, Go back a second, Craig. Is, sure. you're, you're not really contributing anything to it anymore. So is that just earnings? Yeah, that's just on earnings. investments. Just earnings. Gotcha. Uh, we were. To, that's something that we stopped this year. And the reason for it is, is you don't really want to go above twenty three percent for your rainy day fund compared to what your general revenue budget is. It's much better to keep those resources and utilize them either in tax reductions of or uh, of economic development or of capital improvements in maintenance uh, and so we do a combination of the three of those things uh, to make things work for the people of West Virginia so okay and, and that should be about 20 percent of your budget your budget's around six billion so that at 1.2. It's right around five. I thought it was five point nine something at the end of last year. Yeah, that is a little bit of a misnomer on how we calculated things. So it, it, it said that, but it was because of how we were moving money around. So the true uh, budget is more like five. The true budget is more like five one five two. Okay. So uh, unemployment numbers are good. There's if you want a job in West Virginia, you can get one. There's six thousand six hundred thirteen people of total for claims. Uh, for there. Now, there's one other thing that I'm going to talk about that I don't normally talk about on this show, and that is is that uh, the flash report from the West Virginia Investment Management Board came out on uh, October the 31st, and so when it comes to the, it's, this is going to be about the reserves of uh, for the retirement funds. And the public employees, uh, on June the 30th of 2023, there was $8.4 billion in there. Because of the investment, uh, there is now $9.2 billion in there. That is an $800 million increase in our pensions uh, for, for the public employees. Teachers, it was 9.3, now it's 10, so that's a $700 million increase increase. I'm not going to go through the rest of them because they all seem the same shift in, in the increases in the revenues. And that could be all lost tomorrow if the stock market went south. Uh, but that's, it's, you, we're in this for the long haul. Mm-hmm. This is a management uh, side of it. And we've got one of the best pension systems in, this, in the country. What that means, though, in the long run is, is that it helps attract business to the state of West Virginia because they don't think that they're going to get taxed for the sins of the past. No business will choose a state like Illinois because of what's taking place there in their pension system. So this is another thing that, in in all honesty, the Democrats set us on a course, and when the Republicans took over, we stuck with it. We want these pensions under control, and in 2033 or 34, We take $400 million out of our general revenue a year, and we'll be able to stop taking that $400 million out and moving it into the pension fund. In 2033 or four, because you'll be fully funded. Correct. And that will make it so that we can do greater tax reductions or modifications on how we do things in the state. And, And Craig, does fully funded mean that if every state employee retired today, we could fund their pensions forever? Or does it mean if they retire at the date they're expected to retire 20 or 30 years from now? You got it right the first time. Uh, so it's really an, an almost unnecessary amount of money to have right now. I didn't say that in the beginning, but most of the time I preface my comments by saying any time that you see uh, a pension uh, pension that is 80% funded or better, that tells you that you're, you're basically fully funded. Uh, most of ours are, and I can actually tell you that, you give me a talk for a second, and I'll pull up the pension part of it and tell you what the fund it is. Yeah, because I have additional questions on pension funding, too, and that has to do with the judicial budget and the funding for the pensions of those who are elected to the judicial branch because I understand that that is actually overfunded and it cannot 
uh, you can't subtract from that to get it back down to neutral. We'll have some fun now. Yeah. Uh, the, on the public employees, it's 97.6% funded. And this is as of July the 1st of 2023. Mm -hmm. I know the numbers are actually better, but that report doesn't come out until December. Even though it says July the 1st, 2023, it does not come out until January of 2024 okay screwy <laughs> never got that fixed uh, but it is what it is the teachers of defined benefit is 79.9 percent so that's basically 80 mm percent -hmm. uh state police is 95.9 state police plan b 84.8 Judges, this is the one you were just talking about, is 228.8% <laughs> funded. Uh, and the f deputy sheriffs is 87%. Emergency medical services is 103%. Municipal police and fire, 133 And natural resources, 81.65. So you can see why we are one of the best sure. in the country. Now let's go to that uh, judicial that. pension budget, which... Uh, or funding, which is over 228% fully funded. So uh, what prevents you from taking that 128% extra on that and shifting it el elsewhere or just discontinuing co contributions there because it's so grossly overfunded? It's, uh, well, if you ask the judges, they would like to have a better <laughs> retirement, uh, increase their benefits sure. uh, from it because of that. And remember that a lot of those resources that go into that are theirs, uh, where they have it pulled off their check to go into that. Uh, Do they end up getting a and, better retirement than they thought they would get? No. Uh, what happens it, to the extra money then? As it sets, it just sets there. And the bad part about it is the state still makes its match, and I can't remember what that match is mm -hmm. at this point in time. Uh, but I've, I've talked about going back in and saying we want to get ready and address this and qu the state quit matching so much money. The problem arises with it is, is that we're only talking about $156 million in its total. Uh, for that, and that's small potatoes in the scheme of things. Uh, and so by cutting, what you do is you get into an argument with the, the judges, and there's an, another talk bait of wanting to move the magistrates into the judicial retirement system and stuff like that. There's been all kinds of conversations with that. But it's difficult to go in and monkey with these things. If you do, you normally it's like, taking a stick to a hornet's nest. So you're better off sometimes just allowing it to be where it's at. But you have effectively, you have a, a pile of money you can't do anything with it for, in perpetuity. A pile of money, that's correct. It doesn't help the judges because they can't get extra pension money. It doesn't help the state because you can't get to the money. You just have a bunch of money sitting there. Maybe somebody that's replaced me can figure this out. <laughs> uh, because I can tell you right now, in the 20 years yeah. that I've been here, we've not been able to, to crack the nut on this. And this isn't new that this has been overfunded. Uh, but again, it's about priorities. Uh, you can't, uh, when you're talking about saving 500000 or a million dollars, of that is going not being wasted away it, it it is setting there but you can't solve you can't um sweep it either mm -hmm. like agencies you can go in and sweep this you can't sweep uh, and then there are issues with the bonding uh, that where they're invested and everything the investments on there by changing that makeup also I, on how you go about funding it's a complex cookie <laughs> yes all right like I said, that, I, I welcome anybody else to take a crack at it because I've looked at it and wanted to do something with it, and it's not been the easiest. You would think it'd be easy on the surface to do this. Right. It is not. Well, what prevents you if that's from judicial paychecks? So in theory, it's the judges and staffs who have put money into that fund. What prevents you from sweetening their pensions since their pension funds did so well? Because it's not our money. But it's theirs. And why? So how can we? That's stealing if you sweep their. No, I'm not saying you. What's what's to prevent you from not sweeping, sweetening their pensions so they get bigger pension checks? Don't 
<laughs> okay, every judge that's listening right now, Rob's with you. Uh, they, they would like that. Uh, yeah, I can see why. Yeah, they, they, they would like that. Uh, but that would make it so that some judges uh, would have the potential to make more than what they were when they were sitting on the bench. Well, and this would come up with the teachers, too, with an $800 million increase in their, in their pension fund, potentially. You know, if, if that continues, then we could see whatever you could do for the judges' fund could p be done for the teachers' did, pension as yes, well. Yes, but the money's there. It, it, it did well. It performed well. Why so not? Why so if you, you, so if, you can un, if, you can un, if you can untie that knot, then potentially yeah. increase the what well, pension. We fund. have increased for teachers. Uh, and here's how we want to make doing that. And same way for the state employees. Uh, there are two ways that you can either in increase the amount that they get per month or you can do a one-time bonus. Uh, Eric Nelson uh, and I worked together on that, and he's the chair of the pensions committee. And I told him, I said, look, I'm going to give you $21 million. I want you to give back, and I want you to be able to take care of that teacher that retired in 1978. And their retirement was... 500 bucks a month or whatever, even though they worked for 20 or 30 years, whatever that, that could be, but yet they outlived. Well, we need to be able to take care of them. And so we've increased the floor uh, from 500 to 750 to $1,000 a month, the minimum that's coming in. Uh, but then there's been one-time payments that go out for that also. And we were able to, he came in and over budget, it was like $23 million to be able to solve a lot of those problems for the people that are on the pensions like that. And it's one-time spend. It didn't become of... Uh, base building, right? It didn't, yeah, it wasn't a base build, so to speak, where we'd have to go back and put money in every year to do this. So I was very, I was really pleased when what we came up with on being able to manage that for an extra $2 million and we took that out of the excess revenues. Matt Miller. So when I hear you talk about the pensions and where they are now, they weren't there uh, in times past. So we've, we've gotten to this point. How do we make sure we don't end up, you know, while right now we can talk about that we've got enough to maybe increase, um, at, at what point do you make sure that, uh, or how do you make sure, I guess, that, that those funds will be there in the overall long run? Well, this is where institutional knowledge comes to play. In 1992, they were 6% funded, some of the worst in the mm -hmm. nation. And that is where it took hard decisions of, by the legislature to be able to, to write the course, to be able to manage that into the future. If you forget where you were in 1992, you could very well end up in the same place you were before. And the state will have those obligations, okay? You do not get out of them. That means that you'll be voting for increases on all the other taxpayers to be able to meet your pension obligations. Uh, and you will fail on this. This is not like the private sector. This is the public sector. And if you try to for not to, uh, deliver on those, you, you, you will fail in the courts. There's no question about it. So, I'm, I'm confident that, uh, no, let me add one more thing to it. Back in 1992, you weren't, uh, we weren't allowed to invest in the stock market. That's one of the reasons why the pensions were so bad, and there was a constitutional amendment. I believe it was around 96, 98 that allowed the state to actually invest into the stock market. And that has been what we would still be probably 20% funded if we wouldn't have been invested in the stock market in that time period. Yeah. So, but that took a constitutional amendment. We don't have a good track record with constitutional amendments here recently <laughs> on being able to get them passed. Over. Uh, and we're going to get ready and see today which one should be an easy one, but um, I don't know. Uh, but we'll see where the voters go on that one in the state of West Virginia because they, they deployed this one tool, and that is when in doubt, vote no. We do that in the legislature. Uh, when in doubt, vote no. Oh, I'm going back to the, the uh, when you're a delegate, when you're out, you're no longer a delegate. When you're a senator, you get to stay. Your title is always senator from that point on. I don't know about honorable. And then the same way for governor and Mr. President. You, you carry those the whole time. Now, it's the old guard that taught me that when I was in the House of Delegates. So that, that's how I figured that or knew that component of it. So. I want to go back to the $400 million contribution you're making to the pension funds 
to fully fund them through 2033 or 34 potentially. So uh, on the date when that final contribution is realized, does the state obligation go down to zero or is there a floor that you still have to contribute to, to reach? There, there is still a formula that you still have to put in every year. What this is is over and above that amount to be able to get us to where we've got a solvent pension. Is the $400 million Four hundred million dollar extra, or does that include the minimum you have to contribute? It's a com combination of on that of the four hundred million dollars of the, is it all depends on where we're at. There's a whole formula, complex formula that goes into play that makes it so that it tells the agencies what they got to do, and then that comes out of the budget. But where they're overpaying right now to be able to create that extra four hundred million dollars, mm -hmm. and so that formula will get to, so that it will be we'll actually have to stop it uh, by a vote of the legislature to change that formula so then it treads water instead of pulling in too much and that's how you free up the 400 million there's been some temptation to reduce that amount over the years including in the tomlin uh, administration when there were some budget deficits uh, the first justice administration when he announced that there was a 450 million dollar hole some of the suggestions were made, including the first teacher strikes, some suggestions were made by some folks that if we just reduce the amount of overage we're contributing to the pension fund, um, maybe by half, we'd have some extra money to play with. How did you folks avoid the temptation to fuss with that number? Well, and you're, you're spot on. All those things took place, and there was a temptation f even for myself to sit there and say, but the, the carrot, golden carrot is is that when you get across the finish line and you freed up $400 million out of your general revenue b budget, that is a big deal. And not to mention the fact that the economic development aspect I talked about earlier, we want to attract businesses into the state that, that, so that we grow our tax base. Of, and so you're not going to do that if you've got a failing pension system. And so that is what has driven both the, the Democrats and the Republicans to stay the course. And uh, it's been the right course. Uh, it's, it could change. It could change in this up, with the upcoming administration. But I'm doubtful of that. And it would be a mistake if they did. To change if, it was, if it was a good idea, we would have done it. Yeah, you almost paid, the credit cards almost paid off. What do you got? Nine, nine, ten more years to go, and then you're, you're at 100. Yeah. percent and it could accelerate. Of uh, on that, we've talked about putting excess revenues and moving some of them over into the pension, but we d determined that wait a minute, we're close to, <clears throat> to fully funded to start with anyhow at 80. percent Why not just leave that slide through, of uh, the way it is, and keep reinvesting in ourselves. Of, for the economic development aspect of it. Will, when everybody's at 80%, is that when you realize the fully funded, or are you trying to take everybody up to 100%? Well, we're taking everybody up to 100%. And that'll be the that, that, uh, that point at that time. When everybody's 100%, that's when the $400 million contributions can be reduced. Right. And that's just that's almost 10% of the state's budget right now. Because you're at $5 billion and, and $400 million is your contribution. Gives you an, an idea on the... the, the how the pensions have a huge bearing on government spending. <coughs> Excuse me. That was a big part of the Boeing strike was they wanted pensions reinstated. They didn't get it. They got 38% raises, but uh, the pension obligation is a, a big obligation going forward. See, that's one of the beautiful things. We'll, we'll talk when you come back. Uh -huh. Dr. Love playing us in. I understand, Craig, that was one of your nicknames there in, uh, in Charleston, Dr. Love. <laughs> sure it was because <laughs> of your, your cuddly personality yeah. Uh, yeah i'm on week two of not smoking cigarettes hey so. good for you man congratulations yeah. let's see where it holds up or not <laughs> i figured that once i turned 65 and i need to sign up for medicare i might want to quit smoking <laughs> <laughs> Not, I'm on my way out, so I don't need a personality alteration. Yeah, so. hey, no better time than the present to give up the cigarettes, man. Good for you. Good for you. Uh, let's see. As we move into the second half hour here, I hog the first half hour. John or Matt, you <laughs> please lead off the second half hour here. I'm just curious. On uh, somebody's going to occupy your your yeah. president's Senate president's seat. 
whoever that turns out to be, by whatever process that happens. If you were to leave a note for them with your, don't let this happen to you, the greatest concerns, be sure to do this, be sure not to do that, what would be some of the elements on that note you leave behind? Oh my golly, there's a whole lot of things that, that, that come into play for that. And to, guess what? I had that same luxury with Earl Ray Tomlin, who would, would talk to me, uh, Bill Cole, and Mitch Carmichael, who both are very close friends of mine. And so we, I would bounce things off of them all the time. Uh, and the biggest thing is, do not make rash decisions. If you decide that you're, you're mad or you, you don't like something that's happening, do not make that decision right then and there. Give it time. Lots of times things either solve themselves or diminishes of the, the, that comes into play. So if you get able to g take a breath, uh, to, to, you know, to, to, there's, I got told a long time ago when somebody writes you a nasty email, you can sit down and write it. Just don't hit the send button for 24 hours. I think we've all heard this before. Mm -hmm. Same applies to being the Senate president. Uh, and then I would add one other thing, and that is this isn't about what you want. The president's job is not about d dictating and getting what they want. The president's job is to facilitate the will of the members and that and you educate them and you make it so that they're making the best decisions that they can make for the people of their district and for the people of West Virginia. That is something that I'm quite certain that I did and that I got recognized. And it was only those that wanted to be in power and wanted to be dictating didn't like how I went about managing things. And they're confused by it for that matter because everything's always put out in front of them of uh, educated-wise uh, in the Senate so that you, we'd know what was going on. Look, there's nobody will deny that the Senate looked like it moved like smooth as silk down there. Uh, there's rarities. There was a problem, especially when you put it into the contrast of the House of Delegates where that's rough and tumble. Uh, but the biggest thing that we did was is that we always made sure that every senator, including the minority, had the information on the topics that we were dealing with, and you had straight information. You didn't give them what you wanted them to know. You gave them everything, and then you explained to them why it was that we were wanting to do what we wanted to do. And almost always they said, hey, that's a good idea. Well, I'm with it. And that's how you end up with 34 to nothing, 33 to zero to one absent votes. So that's, that's the advice that I would give. I'll add one other thing, the word down there. Your word is the most valuable thing that you have. If you lie to anybody about anything, the word gets out and you are worthless. Nobody can trust what you say. And you can't make good decisions on bad information. And that is standard policy. I got told that early when I was in the legislature of, by, of well, it was Billy Wayne Bailey. Uh, we talked about smoking cigarettes. Billy Wayne was a senator. And him and I were smoking a cigarette together, and I was brand new. And he says, oh, Craig, I want to give you some advice. And it was some of the best advice I ever got. And him and I were, we clown around a little bit, too, mm -hmm. telling jokes and kidding around and all that. Uh, but that was really, really good advice. And then John Yoder, who's a senator, the late John gave Yoder. me the same, same advice. And I learned something. You looked at the people that were doing it right, and you emulate them. And the ones that aren't, and we all know who they are, you try not to do the things that they do. It doesn't mean that's not on the issues. <coughs> it's, it's, it's on the behaviors uh, for, from that standpoint. So that's the advice I would give. But minds change, right? I mean, your position on, on issues will change. Of course, yes. In fact, thanks for saying that. And that's the next thing. You may be one day... It's saying that I'm in favor of term limits. We'll use that since that's the mm -hmm. talk of the day. Then other information comes becomes relevant to you that term limits would be a bad idea. Well, don't hold on to the fact that I said 10 years ago that I'm in favor of term limits and that now I'm going to be a, the wrong side. You're able to switch. If information comes before you that says it's better to do something different from the way you thought, do it. 
take that information in and process it. It's like sitting at the dining room table at night and trying to figure out whether you got the money to do this or do that with your checkbook. Same dynamic. But in politics, what happens is so many people say, well, I promised this and I'm not going to change. And they lock themselves down and to the detriment of the people of the West Virginia and to their districts. And you get called a flip-flopper. Don't give a damn. Who cares about the flip-flopping standpoint on that? If the data says otherwise, you can tell everybody, this is why I did it, and this is why I hope you agree. You mentioned term limits, and ironically, as you were talking about term limits, Ken Matson, who ran against you in a primary, uh, wrote, yeah, like changing your mind on term limits. Talk about that for a second, because it caused Ken to run against you, and that was Ken's main campaign issue. I think he got like 47% of the vote in that primary. Why did you change your mind on term limits for yourself? So the, the, the reason I've changed my mind on it is, is that you had a lot of that conversation already earlier, is that <clears throat> I watched the turnover. Uh, and when you lose the institutional knowledge, and, there, and so, for instance, when Ken ran against me, I was running for my second term and I believe it was, it might have been the third term. Thanks, it was, it, it, maybe it was the third term yeah. in, in the Senate. And uh, that would have been where I had served eight years. And I, I held myself to term limits in the House at eight years. It was either time to move up or move out. I got moved out. I lost to John Unger by like 312, 318 votes. So I spent two years out of the legislature. Then I ran again. And then of when Ken ran against me, I'm trying to do the math in my head. I'd only served eight years, and right now I am the third longest serving senator in the Senate. Donna Boley has been there since the late 80s, early 90s. Uh, Bob Plummel came in in the early 90s, and then I came in in 2012. And you've been in 12 years. And now, and yet that makes you the third longest of 34. Yes. So there's a lot of turnover. Yes, that's the point that I'm getting at. And so you got to be able to have the institutional knowledge for at least some of the members. And that's where the voters, and the voters get to do, they get to exercise the term limits. Paul alluded to that. But I can prove it. I lost my reelection for this, this cycle. Mm -hmm. So the voters made the decision that they would prefer not having me there. And that's cool. That, that uh, Nobody's heard me complain or anything about that. That's term limits in effect. Now, just because I'd said that, and Ken is not happy because I'd said that I'm in favor of term limits, then I changed my mind, then go ahead, run against me. But he lost. And that's fine, too. And I didn't put I did one mailer. Didn't put any signs up except for two in my front yard and one in Charlie Trump's. And it was like, well, you know, if I haven't done a good job, the people will vote me out. And so that's the way I've seen it. And uh, now I also will tell people that if you're Senate president, the whole world's coming after you. And I knew that uh, there's a good possibility that either as finance chairman or the Senate president, I was going to be able to make dramatic changes uh, for the people of the state of West Virginia, and we have, and it has worked. So I'm very proud of my record in that time period. Matt Miller. More than likely, um, the new Senate president will not be from the Eastern Panhandle. Um, what does that mean for the Eastern Panhandle in losing that key position within the legislature? Uh, it, it all depends it, on who the next Senate president is uh, and, and what his working relationships are with the members and how he goes about managing things. Uh, I was very vocal about the fact that what was good for West Virginia was great for the Eastern Pay Handle. I brought hundreds of millions of dollars of funding back to the Eastern Pay Handle, but I didn't brag about it. And I still wouldn't. I wouldn't change that one bit of and the reason for it is is that 
what you're able to target where the resources have the greatest return on the investment and if they've got matching dollars. If you don't do that, what you end up doing is having everybody lined up at your doorstep with, I've got the best project ever, give me, give me, give me, give me. And I learned early in my political career not to take credit for that stuff. And so it could come back to, well, it may have haunted me in this election cycle. I don't care. So I think that to a greater degree, wait a minute, we're going to have a Governor Morrissey from the Eastern Panhandle. And that's going to be the first governor. I believe, ever from the Eastern Pan. As I understand it, yeah. So he's, there's a voice, and as Paul was saying earlier, strong governorship. West Virginia has, in our institution, the governorship is very, very strong. So I don't think it'll have much bearing on it to, to answer your question. <laughs> there you go. In regard, oh, good man. No, go ahead. Yeah. I was saying, in regards to the economic turnaround of the last, uh, well, during the eight years of the Justice Administration, minus the first one, I was uh, asking this question of uh, you and many others, and what was the key piece of legislation that was passed that helped, if indeed there was a key piece of legislation? The answer that came back was making West Virginia a right to work state. Do you agree with that statement, Craig? Uh, it's a, a component uh, of how we've pr turned West Virginia around, and we, and it's it's fruit in the tree, of uh, right to work, prevailing wage, paycheck protection, was all low hanging fruit to send a message out to corporate America that West Virginia truly was open for business. It wasn't just a, a slogan or to something on our signs out there while how Joe Manchin tried to do, that we were in the business of being able to attract business. Now, then you look at some of the other things that uh, the tort reforms that we've done. We got ourselves off the judicial hellhole list. We were able to, 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 to manage our pensions in our rainy days. The flatline budget had something to do with it. And once again, I'm gonna take credit for that. I created the flatline budget and got everybody else to go along with it. And all those things in combination, it's it's the sum of everything that you do that has the benefit on changing the state around, not any given one thing. And so often people think that you want to pick out just one thing and say this is what did it. Now, you do one thing in isolation, it might move the needle a little bit. When you do in concert, that's when you make the beautiful music for the people. And in fairness to the people I asked this question of, they cited the multi-components, but the one thing that came up, and this is even with people who are in economic development, uh, many of whom you obviously know, uh, they cite that as a question that gets asked of them in, from companies that are looking to move into West Virginia and was something that was missing for the longest time that some economic development directors have said it cost West Virginia companies, corporations moving in here in the past. Oh, absolutely it did. And I would listen to people, some of them in economic development, that would actually come forward and say, I've never had one company ask me whether we're right to work. And, like, that wasn't a big deal. Well, we all know why they didn't ask. It's because we, it, you were not on the list to be considered to begin with because you weren't a right-to-work state. It was as simple as that. And so whenever I heard politicians or people in the industry saying that, it's like, oh, my God. And the people bought it hook, line, and sinker, okay? And it wasn't true. And you can see the difference in it for the economic development that's taking place. And I personally— am exposed to right now $30 billion, maybe $40 billion of potential investment in the state of West Virginia. It's all got to come to fruition, and you got to be able to get sites and site ready, and, and a lot of different things are coming into play. But there is tremendous interest in the state of West Virginia. And you're already seeing that in the corporate net numbers that you – shared with us early on in this segment, and that's just the beginning, right? Well, that's the profitability. Right. The cor on corporate net, uh, it's whether the businesses are profitable or not. Not how many of them there are, but so t to answer your question, it's partially right, 
okay. but not solely. Uh, we could have, we had a lot of businesses in the state of West Virginia 15 years ago, but they weren't profitable, okay? And, and the corporate net was higher at that point in time. We've lowered it down since then, but we've made it through the tort reforms and the different things that we needed to do where businesses could be profitable, where they could reinvest in themselves. And that's, we, we do that. Uh, for, in business, you reinvest in yourself for two reasons, to be able to grow your business and to be able to avoid paying taxes on your profits. And so what do you want? What do, in West Virginia, what is it? Do we want to tax them and keep them where they're at? Or do we want them to grow and employ more people and end up being able to pay more taxes in the long run? So <clears throat> taking that theme and then going back to what you were saying, the net positive that uh, Patrick Morrissey, Governor Morrissey, presumably, uh, coming from the Eastern Panhandle, for him to progress in his political career, would, where I would imagine he wants to take his political career, I would think he can't afford to concentrate on the Eastern Panhandle. I would think that he would have to concentrate. Eastern Panhandle is doing very well, thank you very much. I would think that he would have to concentrate on the other parts of the state and sort of not turn his back on the Eastern Panhandle, but sort of avoid the accusations of favoring the Eastern Panhandle to favor the other parts of the state. The heck with that. None of those governors from Charleston never turned their back on Charleston. <laughs> oh, you're spot on. And that's where the Eastern Panhandle, I, our prosperity, the rest of the state thinks that we are beyond wealthy and that we've got it made here because of we do have prosperity here. Uh, opportunities for jobs, not just in the state, but out of the state. Uh, and so... As Senate president, that's one of the reasons why I put the rest of West Virginia first, to lift that. A rising tide lifts all boats. And I'll say it again. What's good for West Virginia is great for the Eastern Panhandle. I frankly believe that Governor Morrissey will adopt the same policies when it comes to doing that because it's good politically. And it's also still good for the Eastern Panhandle. Not once did I say starve the Eastern Panhandle. We've gotten our share of SBA money for years because of our growth. Roads, we've gotten a tremendous amount of money for roads. Water, sewer, $50 million has come here in just the last year for that. But nobody is aware of those things to a greater degree because they're living their lives. They're dead. And we, again, I don't take credit for it. I don't... Patrick might be different when it comes to taking credit for it. Governor Justice loves getting out there with the checks and putting it out. And again, lots of times it's the checks that I help coordinate getting taken across the finish line. Great. I want somebody like that. To, the governor, it's his role. He should be able to do it. But those of us that are working behind the scenes to be able to get the work done, it's it's very gratifying. So. Only a couple of minutes left here, Craig. I was going to get into PEIA, but that seems like it's a little bit deeper than a in a two-minute issue, though, uh, quickly, just uh, on the idea of whether or not privatizing it is a good idea or not, some in the legislature are, are looking at that as an option. Is it, a, is it a realistic option considering labor relations and the fiscal end of this thing? Well, to, 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 I've said over the years that it's not like workers' comp. Uh, PIA right now has a board, and then they have different people that bid every couple of years on the health plans that put forward. It's more of a management thing like the investment management board. Um, we need to do something. I don't believe privatizing anything will solve the problem. And if you really want to do something, and th now this is Craig Blair, remember, every state employee and teacher that is listening to this show today, remember, I'm on my way out. <laughs> okay? So, but... In reality is is that I think we would probably all be better off if we gave the teachers a 30% pay increase and then let them get their own health care. And, and you can there's pooling mechanisms out there to, of, to being able to do that and get the state out of that uh, because we've held the PEIA numbers down we're by half of what the federal government is on what they give to their employees. I could pull those numbers up for you. I've got, we've been studying this. But we're trying to do the right things. That is one of the benefits by being a state employee or a teacher. Your pensions are good. Mm -hmm. Your health care is good. 
your cost of living in this state is less unless you're living here in the Eastern Panhandle. That's why we need the locality pay. But the only way you're going to get that is by having more growth areas in the rest of the state to where you have more haves than have nots, then you get locality pay. Anything else is just words. They won't get, they will not be able to deliver on that. And if they do, I'll buy them all steak dinners because I'd be tickled to death to see that happen. The federal government has locality pay. I took you from PEIA to locality pay, but. No, I got you. Hey, final minute next. Thank you.